Vet Stamp wants to ensure you've maximized your ROI. Line shopping for the best odds matters. And that is why any profitable sports better needs to be using multiple sports books. Thankfully, there has never been a better time to get signed up. And they are here to connect you with the best promotions industry-wide. Using their link, signupexpert.com-tas, you can get access to all the sportsbooks in your region, along with a review of each platform and its unique features. Most importantly, this page automatically connects you to the top promotions at each book, allowing you to start line shopping with an enhanced Hi, I'm Valentina, and you're watching The Todd Atkins Show. Todd has been covering the sports of mixed martial arts all around the world since the 1990s. He's got some pretty close ties to the fight scenes in Hawaii and Japan, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and watch out for future episodes. And hey, don't forget to follow me on TikTok at Valentina da la da Nueva. Hope to see you there. Right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with Zach Partridge, president of a Fierce Fighting Championship in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And, uh, you know, Zach, I want to thank you for taking time to do this. And, you know, I kind of want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to anyone who may not, who may watch this, but may not be familiar with you. Yeah, so uh, I got into the MMA scene about seven years ago. I started training at a local gym. It's kind of a little bit of a weight loss journey. And, um, eight amateur fights and a pro fight later. And now, uh, I started doing, uh, an MMA podcast, which turned into an commentary, uh, commentary job for fierce fighting championship, right. As the, we were kind of coming out of COVID, uh, the talking to the, the owner of fierce fighting championship more, um, led into him asking if I wanted to help him with doing some matchmaking on future shows. And I'd been really interested in learning the business side of it as an entrepreneur. So, um, yeah, so it kind of went from fighter and still fighting, but commentating to, to matchmaking a little bit to, uh, about a little over two years ago, he handed over the keys to the Ferrari for me and, um, and it pointed me as the COO and head matchmaker. And so I, he kind of stepped away and I brought it, I built together a team and, and we, we run the show, we put on shows every month here in utah and idaho and yeah it's pretty fun let's kind of go back to the part so you had your podcast you know the mma podcast kind of yeah. led into the commentary so maybe talk about the podcast first yes yeah, so what, what it was and me me and one of my buddies uh jason laporte we started a a podcast called the damage plan mma podcast oh, yeah, yeah, yeah i've heard of it yeah so we we did that for years and it, and it was just me and him doing it out of our office and we wanted to just give a bigger platform to some of the Utah fighters. Uh, we per, predominantly an amateur fight scene here in Utah, which is the amateur fights. And, and uh, we kind of wanted to do something for the fighters to, to help get their story out there. Everybody, it's the beauty of MMA is everybody has kind of a different background comes and gets a part of it um, for different reasons, you know, whether it's just competition bullying you know i was bullied as a kid or whatever they'll say for me it was a weight loss journey um whatever and so we started our podcast and then uh me and him both you know we watch all the ufc fights so we do a kind of an interview every week and we would do a uh, recap of the ufc fights or a uh a lead up to the U the next ufc fights where we would make our picks and then recap the ufc show cover local utah mma and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was just kind of a blast and it kind of showed me the big picture that I wanted to get more into the business side of MMA. I'm 35 years old. I'm a, I'm an Owen one pro. I, I'm not going to any big shows. I still love fighting and training, but, um, you know, I'll, it's a young man's game. So, uh, as I kind of phase out of the fighter area of my, uh, MMA love, it's, you know, staying, finding a way to stay involved and, and give back to the sport that's done so much for me 
Yeah, and uh, Damage Plan. Were you a fan of Damage Plan? Is that why? No. Um, that? Oh, okay. So uh, Jason bought a – so it's really funny. Uh, Jason bought the Damage Plan Athletics clothing line here in Utah, oh. which was like a clothing company. And I don't know if they were a fan of the band or how that came about, but – um, he, he spot, he actually sponsored me with, through his clothing company. And then we were talking, I'm a big sports nerd. I love football, baseball, basketball. So we were just talking how fun it would be to do a podcast. And then it turned into a, doing a, he was going to start a podcast as an ex Marine and then it just became MMA. And then we named it the damage plan MMA podcast. And I own an insurance agency. So that turned into damage plan insurance. And like, we've just kind of put it under that umbrella. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. The, the Mavericks wolves last night was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The series, is the, man. Uh, so I'm one that I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm here in Utah, so I'm a lifelong jazz fan and. <laughs> excuse me it's not it's not really fun when your team's tanking but uh these playoffs have been a lot of fun to follow and watch yeah um so let's kind of talk about how the how the podcast kind of parlayed into the commentary kind of talked about how that how that kind of came about excuse me yeah so uh man i was supposed to fight uh fierce fighting championship is kind of the bigger stage they fight at a i fought for another local promotion like I said, more does amateur fights and fierce does a kind of a, a bigger stage pro cards. It it's called the Maverick center. It's right, right outside of downtown Salt Lake holds about 12,000 people, huge venue, kind of a thing that a lot of Utah fighters want to fight at at some point is fight at the Maverick center and a bigger venue and, and a big show vibe. And as an amateur, uh, I, I had the opportunity. I was going to fight a, uh, a undefeated kid, um, Johan Rubio, who had beaten one of my teammates and I was getting ready. I had like, I felt like one of the best camps of my life and <clears throat> the card got canceled 24 hours before weigh-ins due to COVID another like COVID spike. Okay. Like we, we would, we were following all the health department guidelines. We were told it was going to be, everything was going to be a go. No, no problems. <clears throat> they were taking, you know, COVID precautions, but there was another spike happening in Utah and ultimately the health department came in and, and, and axed it. I, I was literally in the bathtub 24 hours before weigh-in starting my, my, my weight cut when I got the message that the card got canceled and it was a huge bummer. <clears throat> uh, fast forward. I had a, I had some things in my life kind of, uh, make it so fighting immediately wasn't an option, uh, coming out of COVID. Um, also I just wasted a whole camp to not fight. So I kind of wanted to see some events start happening before I committed to fight again and not, you know, not get another event canceled on me. And, uh, fortunately fierce fighting championship asked if I wanted to do the play by play, um, or be the color commentator on their, on their broadcast team for their first show after COVID. And, and I accepted and, uh, cause they'd heard me on the mic before for my podcast and stuff. So, uh, uh, I was really grateful for that opportunity and, um, just try to make the most of it. Right. And then you end up taking over the show, kind of take yeah. us through that. Cause that's a, <laughs> that's a huge <laughs> jump. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I really wanted to get into the bit. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, st I bought my first franchise of a company when I was 22, 23, I've owned multiple companies and, uh, you know, my goal has always been though, to own, own, a work in a, an environment where I'm working with my friends and, you know, doing something that I love and, uh, you know, doing, I did electronic dog fences, a mobile car detailing business, uh, my, my insurance brokerage, I'm doing all these things that good companies, but not what I love, not what I love to do. MMA sports is what I love. And then once I found MMA, like became my love and my passion. And, um, yeah, so. I kept kind of asking like, Hey, I kind of want to learn the business side. I knew I'm not going anywhere as a fighter. Um, still take fights when the opportunities happen, but that's, that's what I wanted to do was, is learn the business side. And uh, Cody, the owner of fierce was gracious enough to uh, start giving me some opportunities. And yeah. And I think he found that I kind of had a knack for the matchmaking and 
finding good matchups, you know, matchmaking is so much more than just finding two people in a weight class. It's, it's building storylines. It's, it's, it's finding who can fight, who win or lose, like making sure you have plans for these fighters after. And, and maybe, you know, if you have two really good studs in a weight class, don't, match them up right away, kind of put them on a collision course together and, and, and to, to fight for a belt, you know, down the road or something, those types of things, uh, you just felt like I had a knack for and a good vision for, and I just had a vision for Utah MMA is a breeding ground of young talent that just, they haven't had the stage yet. And we needed to build a bigger stage for them to get opportunities on. And, uh, he, fortunately he, uh, he saw the vision and, and, uh, and he just said, Hey man, like you, you got a good vision for it. I think, I think you'll be successful at it. He's, Tell me what you need to do and, and, you know, take over fierce. I was kind of playing with the idea of starting my own show too. So he said, you, you don't need to do that. Just, just come take over mine. So now what did he do when you took it over? Did he step away? Yeah, he stepped, he just stepped, he's the owner and he supports me and, and what I do and, uh, you know, I mean, he's the president and owner. I, I'm just the COO, the chief operating mm-hmm. officer is kind of my title with it. But he, uh, yeah, he just, he supports us. We started our Challenger Series, uh, which is our amateur show. So we do kind of am, uh, uh, AMI shows that give uh, the amateurs more reps. And then about every, about five, six times a year, we have big pro cards as well. But I mean, when he stepped away, was it something where he was wanting to look to get away from it? Or maybe just, okay, let Let's let you take Man, I, honestly, and I'll, I'll be behind the scenes still. Yeah, honestly, I think it was kind of a, he, he has another very successful company that, that does well, that takes a majority of his time. And this was more of a hobby. He was only doing uh, maybe three to four shows a year, I believe. So now that we've ramped up and we're doing, we're on track to do 12 shows this year. And in 2025, we'd like to start hitting, you know, 15 to 18 shows in the year um, between a couple markets um, and our growth. I think it's he's seen the growth and where we're going and how fun it is and it's kind of re-energized him. So he he uh yeah, I mean he's he's around. I just our team just takes care of most of it. Was he into the game before you took it over? Was he Yeah, he's a pro yeah, fighter himself. Okay. Yeah, he's a pro fighter himself. I believe he wrestled in college, uh had some fights, owns a gym here in Utah. Uh was a pro like I said, pro fighter himself and was uh running the show kind of in a small town in central Utah called price price, Utah, and then brought it up to Salt Lake city to do a big show at the Maverick center. And then that's kind of where I've kind of like interjected and taken the reins and we've, our team's kind of taken it to a new level. So you take it over. What did you kind of change to? Um, Spike. honestly, I mean, just the activity, right. Um, building a team that could put on shows, uh, our first year, my first year, we did seven shows. Uh, we ramped it up to seven last year. We did 11, like I said, on track this year to 12, but we're trying to put the pieces in place to be able to do more than that. That was the biggest change is just adding that challenger series and adding an extra show. Um, that's just AMI based to have more amateur fighters get their reps. And then, um, and like continue and keep that going and continuing that, um, more pro shows and give the pros. The problem is there wasn't a show here in Utah where the pros could get reps. It was like Amy, Amy, Amy. And then if you want to go pro, you're probably going to have to kind of get reps out of state. Um, so now, now that we have that, we're really building kind of a, you know, just build up Utah MMA. That, I mean, that's the, that's the goal is, is to be a, a path so that our Utah fighters can have a clear path to, you know, those bigger shows, Bellator, PFL, UFC. What was the thought process from going like 12 to maybe 15? We have so many fighters here that want to fight and fight on our show. Um, As a fighter myself, I kind of um, admittedly probably don't always make the correct business decisions in favor of the fighters because I want to give them what they want. I know how hard it is to be a fighter and what it's like to be an aspiring fighter. I'm in a gym full of fighters that have dreams of going to those big shows. And I run the, sh- I run a show here in Utah. That's a vehicle that's going to allow them to do it. So I just have a hard time telling fighters. No. So one of those things is, is fighters ask us more and more all the time to get on our shows. And I'm like, man, like I only have so many spots 
that we can have, you know, on, on these shows and, and the, the, you know, there's no multi-fight deals, but just our, what I would consider our roster, our pool of fighters, there's just an abundance of people that want to fight and stay active. And I, I can't do that only doing one show a month, you know, well, 12 fights on a card about 12 to 14 fights on a card. I can't keep them all active. Do you keep them all in the same venue doing that many or no, we've oh. actually moved around quite a bit. Um, the Maverick centers are kind of our home base. Our challenger series has moved around. We've done them in event centers, high schools, um, wherever we just kind of move around the state. Uh, but we did just launch um, our new home for our challenger series 10, is in about three weeks we'll be at a venue that we believe will be more of a home base for that um it's kind of like a little mini apex for us it's small it's intimate holds about 600 people we'll sell it out every time but they have really cool projecting light and sound systems that will make the fan and fighter experience pretty awesome there and now that you've doing this many shows has it kind of replaced some of the side the other businesses you had or uh, you no, know, they just make them harder. <laughs> so we, you know, I'm, I still own my insurance agency. I still own my car detailing company. Um, I have business partners, my business partner that we kind of do everything together. Uh, he's a part of fierce with me. He's not really an MMA guy, but it's awesome to have more of a casual MMA fan, um, on our team. That's so integral in our, in our processes and our systems, because he kind of gives us that perspective of like what just a normal casual fan would want to see. Right. I think so many promotions are full of uh diehard MMA people all the time, but I mean, really you're going to get your, your diehard MMAs anyways. Um, you need that perspective for more casual MMA fans on what they think. So, um, his, his partnership and his perspective is invaluable to what we're doing and growing MMA in Utah. Um, but you know, as a team, you know, we've kind of, we kind of set up systems and let, let the other things run and, and the other stuff is they're, they're running and, and I put most of my focus into fierce fighting championship. Now, how's the response in Utah? You think as far as the, the fan attendance and that kind of thing, we're growing. I mean, we're, we're making moves and we're growing and, and fierce is, you know, we've, We've had some, we've had some big names there. You know, Chris Curtis was headlining our cards before he got signed to the UFC. Um, we've had names like Steven Seiler, who's, you know, PFL finalist, uh, UFC ultimate fighter vet, uh, Mitch Ramirez, who's now in the UFC just got signed. He fought for us. Um, we have some prospect. I mean, it's just, it's growing. And, uh, you know, we, Utah has a long history of really good MMA. They had a show called showdown back in the day that was putting a lot of fighters into the ultimate fighter in the UFC mm -hmm. team. Alpha male was coming out here pretty regularly. Um, a lot of those guys came up through, you know, showdown here in Salt Lake. Um, we have a long history of really good fighters. Josh Berkman's from here, you know, UFC OG mm -hmm. court McGee still here and He's at almost all of our shows cornering guys as he owns a gym here locally. Um, Bobby King, who's a Bellator PFL vet. Uh, you, you'll see him in the corner next weekend at our big show. Uh, you know, we, Dwayne Ludwig's been at our show. We, Henry Cejudo is rumored to be at our show next weekend. Tracy Cortez was here earlier this year. I mean, we, it's, uh, as as our show's building, there are more and more people are coming. I think the UFC coming to Salt Lake City has also helped. Yeah, what was the response to that like when they came? It was awesome, man. Like we we leaned into it. I mean, I think some promotions, um, I'm not saying here in Utah, but just generally, they kind of feel like when big shows come, they step on toes or or whatever. We just lean into it. Like it's for if bringing eyeballs to MMA and and stuff, it, it, it's a good thing. To, it's still a growing sport. And UFC's just, it's it's a baby as far as being mainstream, right? And bringing right. MMA to me. So we just lean into it, um, try and market around it. Uh, we obviously don't put any shows up really around it to try and, you know, we don't want to compete with the UFC. We we just want it to all be supportive. And um, yeah, I think it's been great. You know, they brought two pretty epic cards here and i know they're coming again later this year and i plan i think they'll do the same thing you know we but we've been but being able to watch leon edwards 
you know, upset Kamara Usman here. And then, you know, Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier do the BMF title here. Uh, you know, it, it, it's awesome for the MMA community here in Utah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, like they came to Tulsa one time, a long time ago, kind of near where I live, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, uh, they haven't been back, but I know the response, the crowd was very big, you know? The, yeah. The venue they have is brand new. But I, well, they haven't come back since, so I don't know what the situation is with that. Well, you know, Dana, I mean, Dana just talked about how we need to get out of the apex and and, yeah. and get back on the road and, and doing those shows. And he's right, because what it's doing is he's he's. I mean, people this I mean, this is how I found your show, right? Somebody was talking about the kind <laughs> of the business of the UFC. Yeah. And um, people have to understand, you know, it is a business and uh but the thing is, is when the UFC goes and travels across the country and travels across the world, what they're doing is they're growing fan bases. As they grow their fan bases, more people are going to join local MMA gyms and be more interested in local MMA shows. Well, the local MMA shows are what build up the prospects that get them to the UFC. So by traveling, they are investing in their future fighters um, and building up those markets. So I'm, I'm sure places like Tulsa, Oklahoma and stuff, I'm sure you're going to get a fight night again, you know, when they can, but again, yeah. you could, they only, you know, there's so many shows. I think they, they're contracted with ESPN for 48 shows a year. So, uh, but yeah, all markets, I think the more markets they can hit, the better it's going to be for them. Yeah. I've, I've seen enough live MMA in my life, but you know, cause I lived in Japan and, Okay. You know, I lived on Oahu for 14 years. I saw a lot out there at the time. It was really big, but yeah, it, it was, I think it was good for the area, but I don't yeah. know. Maybe the site fees or something had something to do with it. I don't know. They, they make enough money, man. It just, it doesn't. <laughs> but how uh, big, do you know how big the venue is? The arena? How many people holds? Oh, it's big. A lot of big acts come through here. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, then yeah. I'm sure because if they'll come, if they can come and sell it out and get the gate that they want, um, you know, they'll be happy. The reason why they keep coming back to Salt Lake is because they came that first time. And that place like 80% sold out, and then the fans showed up for the early, early prelims. Like if you go to the the Vegas shows, I've been to T-Mobile Arena. You go for the early prelims, and there's like a thousand people in there. It's kind of a bummer, you know. Yeah. But uh, you go, but you go when they came to Salt Lake, you know, that place was 80, 90% full for that very first prelim er, early prelim fight. And that place was rocking all night. It, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know uh, Max Holloway fought on the, on this uh, fight night card. It was against Clay Collard and uh, Clay is another Utah local boy. Yeah. And I, I lived on a while for 14 years. So I know um, Max's jiu -jitsu yeah. coach really well. And oh, cool. they were with me that whole week. And he said, man, that venue is, pretty damn nice you know yeah. like because it's barely it's like almost brand new yeah when they, when I'm they sure came so yeah. yeah but uh let's kind of talk about your uh training journey because you kind of got into the promoting side maybe take yeah. me back to when you first started training i know it was a weight loss thing but let's kind of maybe talk about where you went maybe what yeah. what what pulled you in there so i mean it re really it goes back to i was i was my buddy introduced me to watching MMA. It was right at the rise of Conor McGregor. And mm -hmm. so it was really fun. Um, but we, me and my, me and my oldest son, who's 12 now, he, we were just watching a fight night and he was just kind of running around. And I was like, man, I should get him into some, he's at the age where it's, he's starting to drive me nuts. He needs something to send him to, to, <clears throat> you know, get his energy out. So I messaged one of the local MMA gyms that I knew I had a buddy that, that trained at and I just asked him if they, he could come and, uh, he came and he started doing kickboxing and jujitsu as a five-year-old and I'd go and I'd watch and it was cool. Um, then one of the local pro fighters said, Hey, I'm fighting this weekend. You guys should buy tickets and come watch me fight. Like one of the ways that local fighters make money is they sell tickets and yeah. they get a percentage of the ticket sales. Right. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, it sounds fun. Support the gym and who's, you know, they're nice to my son and kind of getting into it. And, um, I was, uh, I was a three sport athlete in high school. I played football, baseball, basketball, um, a couple of knee surgeries after high school mm -hmm. and just put on a lot of weight and, you know, kind of figured my athletic part of my life was pretty much over. I was 270 pounds. Uh, just didn't seem like sports had 
being in shape was ever going to be a thing in my life again. And I went and watched those fights and uh, I signed up at the gym myself uh, the next Monday and um, started losing some weight. And it was cool because I wasn't getting getting hurt while I was doing it. And um, but I was I'm competitive and it was just a lot of fun. And my coach said, hey, you, you know, you're pretty athletic. Would you would you want to do a fight? I was like, yeah, I, I think that would be a really fun, like bucket list one time goal thing to do. And he said, you get down to, to where you can make 205 and uh, we'll, we'll do a fight. I signed up in April. I fought December 9th of that year, made 205 pounds. Uh, one thought it was the best rush ever. Um, got dropped three times in the first round and somehow survived long enough to take his back back and get a rear naked choke win so it was unreal and then but like i said i got dropped three times i got i got dropped with a head kick just full shin to my face in the first like 15 seconds of the fight and it kind of kind of messed with my equilibrium for a good month after the fight and i was having dizzy spells and stuff but then they went away and then i so I, but i didn't really think i was going to fight again and then i got offered another fight and i was like i, I don't know and then I watched the guy. And I was like, I can, I can beat that guy, and and I did. And I went to two and zero. And then it was, let's just kind of see how far we can go. So, just been yeah, training ever months. since. I mean, you were only years. training six months for the first one, right? Yeah, because that's really quickly to do it. Yeah, very. Quickly. I mean, growing up being an athlete and and doing sports, though, I kind of I'm I'm pretty analytical, and I feel like that helps me a lot. Um, I think I mean. I think being able to accurately analyze where you're at um, and being able to be heads up in, in early, you know, in a fight, I think it helped me, my, my, my sport background, just even first things in my fight when I knew like I was hurt and I was in trouble, but cognitively thinking like, I need this fight to happen in my corner where my coaches are not his corner early on in the fight. And so, I mean, after the first time I got dropped, I basically got up and bear hugged the dude and just pulled him and like ran him. I had no wrestling, didn't do any wrestling. I had no idea what I was doing. So I just pulled and kind of threw him over to the side of the cage where my, my coaches were, and I got dropped again there, but at least my coaches could, I could hear them and I couldn't hear his corner. Like the, doing those little things early on in my career, I think is what, what got me through to be able to have some success. Um, like I said, not a great athlete, but uh, I've always just kind of been a gamer. Not not great in the practice room or whatever, but when it when it's time to go, um, uh, it's uh, I'm like I said, I'm competitive. I don't like to lose, and um, I I will fight to the death. <laughs> but I mean, when the coaches came to you, it was only six months after. Did they kind of tell you why they? wanted you to do it that quickly or was it just hey we have this we want you to do this it. it's what we do at the gym you know we're a fight gym and you can be there yeah. and have your own goals and do whatever you want but i mean if you're training like what are you what are you there for there i mean there's guys at our gym i have, I have good friends at the gym that they come and they spar and they do all the things with with the fight team but they have no intention of fighting and yeah that's fine like the, it's totally fine but they're always going to get asked I, I i i have a buddy lucas I, he's my age and he's like, I don't want to get in there against some, you know, some young killer or whatever. But I'm like, dude, you come, you come do it at the gym every week. Like just try it. Like you won't regret it if you try it, but he just doesn't, he just doesn't have that desire in him and which is totally fine. But again, every four to six months, like, oh man, you're getting pretty good. Are you sure you don't want to try it once? You know, just do it one time. Um, and so when the people are asking me, Hey, you want to do it once? I was like, yeah, I do. Like, that'd be awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's interesting because I think everyone kind of has their own approaches to it. Some coaches prefer their guys train for a little bit longer, you know. Some don't. Um, yeah. So, it's interesting I mean, to see just different thoughts. Yeah, processes. I mean, as as I coach now, so I, I help coach at my gym. And I do one-on-ones with guys. And my one of the guys that I do one-on-ones with took his first fight in March um trade with me i i'm i make all my people train for at least a year yeah i tell all of them if you think you're going to just come in train for a few months and take a fight you're, you're crazy because yeah. you're, you're gonna get whooped so um <clears throat> so if you can't commit to i'm going to train for a year then just put it out of your head i'm not going to fight 
But if you're like, yeah, because I, I want them to fall in love with the training and the whole process. It's not, this isn't a quick, like one and done. I, you know, uh, fighting and MMA and being a mixed martial artist, it's, it's become a, a lifestyle for me. I mean, I'm, I got my black belt from my coach in uh, kickboxing in his, his striking system. Uh, I'm a purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like I'm, whether I'm fighting or not, if I'm healthy and not injured, I'm there training every day to improve. And I think like if, if I'm coaching, I, that's what I want my fighters to do. But I, that's also what helped me be able to fight so quickly is my coach saw how dedicated I was. Like I, I don't miss practice or anything just cause I'm not feeling it that day. Like I'm there every day, six days a week. Yeah. And is that what you want? Like I want when you say a year, you want them there every day for a year. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Like consistently training. I mean, dude, we all have jobs, real life. I'm married. I have four kids. Um, four boys, uh, you know, stuff happens where I can't make it to every single practice all the time, but my coaches and my teammates all know too. I'm not home during the gym time because I just like, didn't feel like going that day. Like I'm busy like that. That's kind of what I expect out of people that want to fight and, and stuff. If I think it's crazy as a promoter. I hear it all the time. I'll call somebody and be like, Hey, would they be interested in taking this fight? And like, man, I haven't seen that guy in four months since he last <laughs> fought for you. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To me. It's so crazy. that It's not say, uncommon, dude. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, it's not. What's even crazier is I have, I, I talk to managers that manage UFC fighters mm -hmm. that are, that, that tell me that this is common in with UFC fighters. Yeah. They'll like take a fight and then it's like, but man, I mean, we're, we'll get into it. Cause again, this is what like kind of the fighter pay stuff and, and all that stuff, um, is what caught my eye on, on your video. But, um, yeah, fighters, if you're only fighting twice a year, like what, what are you doing? What are you doing with the rest of your time? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, when I lived on Oahu, you know, Fighting was really big when I when I first got there in 1996. He had this event, Super Brawl, that was run by a T.J. Thompson, and uh, he had all kinds of guys, well-known guys in his shows, plus local guys. And yeah, you <laughs> he would go around saying, "How's this guy doing?" You know, have you you know to some of the local coaches, and they'd be like, "We haven't seen him." And these are good fighters that are, yeah. you know, they have a fight coming up in his show, and they're like, "Haven't seen him that much." It's insane. Man. <laughs> I, we had a, I had a guy, he used to be a teammate. He was undefeated. Um, he was an undefeated pro nine and oh, was going to be on the ultimate fighter, got kicked out of the house for failing two weed tests, which is stupid. But at the same time, you know, you're going to get tested. You know how long it takes to get out of the system. Like don't fill your weed test. LFA comes to Salt Lake city and he's the headliner fighting a very tough wrestler loses LFA comes back, has him back again. And he goes, Oh, that guy sucks. He's not, his wrestling isn't very good. We saw him in the gym one time as he was going to main event LFA he came to the gym one time and he got absolutely mauled and he's never been back to our gym sets. And I was just like, dude, you, I mean, just, and they're the fighters. They, they get to this, uh, a level, they get to a level um, where they really have chances to do stuff. And then I don't know if it's focus, motivation, arrogance, what, but too many of them lose, yeah. lose focus on what the real, real mission is. But, you know, maybe that wasn't theirs all along. Who knows? Oh, I mean, there's some of them. You're right. Like, I think it could be any of those, but you have some of them, like you said, who were they? They don't think they need to train. You know, they've, they've done well. The tech, Tank Abbott types, you know, the, yeah, but it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's 2024, man. Like this whole, and I talk about it all the time. There's a whole wave. We, I have a kid at my gym. He's one of my best friends. He's a one and O pro now, 155, nine and one amateur, one and O pro. He's 23. People think that he's a kid and that they're like, I'm, I'm a grown man and I'm experienced. I've been training for a decade. For a decade, this kid's not going to beat me. He's been training since he was five. He's been training for 18 years. 
you're not going to catch up to that kid because he's dedicated and he trains like five, six days a week since he was five. Mm -hmm. That whole wave of fighters is coming. And all those fighters that don't take that training seriously like that, they're going to get washed out over the next five years. Like there's not going to be a place for him in MMA anymore at a high level. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, <clears throat> you've had those kind of that way for a while though. I think it's been around for a while, maybe since maybe even the early two thousands, late nineties, you know, cause you had guys like, you know, you start having these super teams pop up like Militich you had, you know, teams in California, Caesar Grace yeah. team early. You had a Shark Tank. You had a bunch of different in different states, and mm -hmm. now you have even more of those. So I think yeah. I think that's been there to some degree. But you're right; it, it's what takes the guy out again. Yeah, you know, because you do it. You have the guys that train forever, but something just takes them out of it. Either they're not motivated to do it, or they get too too big to where they don't think they need to do it. They take a loss or two and then it's, you know. Yeah, it's, it, there, there's nothing like, there's not, there's nothing like the fight game in that aspect. Yeah. And how long you can keep doing it. You know, that's what impressed me about Max is that he's done it this long. And he's still doing it. Yeah. And he that's looks hard. like he might that's be hard. hitting, it looks like he might be hitting like, like a, a second prime. He might be primed to go on a second prime run right now. Um, it, 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 it's not only hard, like it's, it's unreal. Like he went from being a beloved. It was like, it was like after he lost the Volk the third for the, for the third time, it was like, then he was just the beloved guy. Right. And right. he thought, and a lot of people seem to think to write him off that he was going to be like a journeyman the rest of his career or something or the gatekeeper or whatever. And then with one unbelievable performance and knockout, obviously He's turned it. He's literally turned into a superstar. Uh, like, I mean, he's that knockout pro probably made him a top five superstar in the UFC. Yeah, it's crazy. Where before, where before it was like he was just kind of beloved, but I wouldn't have called him like a superstar, you know. So with everything that he's accomplished, the fact that he wasn't a superstar is kind of wild. But now it's like, and now he could call a shot. He could do Ilya. He can wait for Islam. He could do the Dustin uh, BMF lightweight title. If um, Dustin won, he can wait for Connor. He he can do whatever he wants now, and he gets to call a shot, which is a pretty cool driver's seat for him to be in. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild that he's the one who's kind of had even more longevity than BJ had, you know, as far as Hawaii fighters go. Sure. Um, I wouldn't have expected it, honestly, <laughs> you know, but he did. Yeah. With the way he fights, yeah, I mean it's 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 kind of it's kind of crazy. Now, uh, kind of tell me, you know, we talked about you being a promoter, your training, your shows to some degree, and we'll get into that a little bit more, you know, to talk about some of the shows you have coming up. But maybe as a person who's in the in the game and who's a fan of the game, kind of what are you paying attention to, or what what kind of stories or fights or what's interesting you so far? everything right um it's every show it's every weekend it's fun with the ufc um i'm very very interested you know uh the dustin poirier thing right now like that's for me that's the storyline that's the most interesting uh daniel cormier came out and talked about uh um he doesn't like how dustin's kind of talking about this is it you know but i just think he's being real too yeah. like i i think he's being real and he's being honest and i think I don't, I don't believe lying to yourself is, uh, is generally a good thing. Um, I'm somebody that I'm, I'm honest with myself, like as a fighter, like, dude, I know where I sit. Like I'm in the room with other killer, like with killers. I'm not a killer like them. Like I'm a fighter and I'm tough, but like, I'm not a killer, but I'm honest with myself and my self evaluation with where I'm at. Dustin saying like that, you know, he's towards the end. Like that's not a, I don't think he's putting himself down or whatever. He just knows like he is getting older. Like at some point in the very near future, there's going to be a diminishing return on, on his ability to, you know, fight more than once or twice a year because of his age. And you start, you know, the only thing that's undefeated in sports, it's one of my favorite sayings. Only thing that's undefeated in sports is father time. If you don't do what Khabib did, 
you will lose eventually, or you will start going downhill eventually. Unlike, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, BJ Penn, even though he wasn't getting knocked out, it's like, Mm -hmm. you could just see it just passes you by, you know, the body's will, the Brian's willing, but the body isn't. Mm -hmm. So um, that story is very interesting with me right now. I'm very interested to see, uh, what Max and Ilya does, Sean O'Malley talking, you know, Sean O'Malley's been talking about coming up after Ilya Teporia. If Max chooses Ilya, um, they're, they're making some, they're, they're some talks that Max versus Teporia and, and O'Malley versus Marab is going to be on the same card at the sphere in September. I mean, that would be pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, the trajectory on that. Um, I am kind of waiting to see what the UFC does with women's MMA. I feel like all the divisions are pretty stagnant and not, Hmm. not interesting. And I'm one that I think the women's martial artists, it can be really fun, but there's just, there, there is something missing right there that there's not really a superstar or story. And it's like, I don't know that that's, that's interesting to me right now is how like every division kind of just is what it is and there's nothing super exciting happening in them um and then and then of course you know what's going to happen at heavyweight with tom aspinall curtis blades john jones stipe when that happens kind of the interesting dynamic of matchups their future fights is john and stipe both just going to retire after they fight i think he will you know it's something it's interesting you brought up uh poirier and it's kind of similar jones right Looks like he mostly probably wants to fight Stipe and maybe not fight Aspinall. But maybe he'll get pulled into it if, if the money's good enough. But, you know, if, I don't know if you watched my last show, but we were talking about Canelo and David Benavidez, you know, and uh, Scott Burnett, who's Mikey Burnett's brother. Mikey Burnett was fought in the very early UFC events. Um, really good lightweight. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he fought Pat Militich and some other guys uh-huh. like that. But anyway, Scott was saying, you know, he's trained a lot of boxers in the area, and he was saying, the fans all want <laughs> they all want to see the guy get eaten like in the Roman Coliseum, no matter how great they are, like Poirier. You know, Cormier saying, Why why would he walk away? He, well, Cormier wants him to walk away once he's been eaten by the lion, you know? Yeah. Not when he's still all you're so good. Why why would you stop? They Cormier yeah. wants to see him get eaten first. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I for sure, but you know, like dude, people criticize Khabib for walking away right. too early. I'm like I to me. He did it right. If he accomplished what he was, what he's good with, and he's he's satisfied with his legacy, he did it right. Like you can't, and and this is something that I didn't understand as well. And it seems like such a simple statement, but until you deal with fighters day in day out, I don't think people realize how much it's like. You can't make somebody fight that doesn't want to fight. You you can't, and you or you won't get a good version of them. And so when a fighter, if they are ever, this is where I I really applaud data. If you, when he says it all the time, if you think you might be done, you should just be done. Or else you're going to get brutally knocked out probably in front of tens of thousands or millions of people. Mm -hmm. When your knockout becomes a reel that goes viral on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. And I think the same with Jones, the fans want to see him fight Ospinal. Because they want to see if he gets eaten or not. Uh, yeah, at, for at, sure. At this point. But see, Jones is different for me, though. Yeah. I, so as a fan of greatness, John Jones is, right. his resume is unmatched. Mm-hmm. The amount of Hall of Famer world champions that he's beaten is unreal. But the problem is, is John Jones will never fully satisfy the fans because of his own his own doing right he took multiple layoffs for years it's like you know and and it's so funny because it kind of to me it looks like a little insecurities like when he was crying about Khabib being the pound for pound number one and he's like what about me and this and that it's like dude you kind of made yourself irrelevant in the goat conversation because of your own actions, you've taken yourself out of competition and you choose like love it or hate it. It's the reality of the dynamic. Like we've probably missed a total of five, six years of 
prime John Jones. It was his own self. I'm not talking about injuries. I'm talking about his own self doing of suspensions and arrests and like and sitting out and missing, missing UFC 200. Yeah. You know, missing, missing these epic moments. He could have been a part, you know, and, and fights and stuff. In sitting out to change his body for heavyweight, which while fundamentally I understand. You have people like Brendan Schaub, who is like, I used to train with him when I was a heavyweight, and he used to train with the heavyweights at Jackson Week, and he would F us all up. He was still 225, 230 pounds fighting at 205. Like, how much weight did he really have to put on to be a heavyweight? And he chose to sit out and serves him, serves him well, but like, I don't think the Cyril Gain fight happens any differently. Do you? No. Like why did he at first I thought maybe he might have some trouble with him because you know younger guy moves well but yeah he just walked right over him so in but, hindsight but you, in hindsight it, it probably wouldn't have been different had he but when once you yeah. saw how easily he handled him do you really think that that extra weight that he put on really changed anything no like I just think mentally he just I I don't know it, it's weird the John Jones saga is his career is going to be one of the greatest what ifs of all time. It's yeah. It, it's an interesting thing to think about for sure. Well, cause he's great and he's the <laughs> goat, but at the same time, he literally could have made his resume untouchable. I don't think it's untouchable. It's pretty good though. Yeah. It's, especially when you have younger guys that are doing a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe let's talk about one more. What do you think about the McGregor um, Chandler dynamic? coming up here well as somebody that got into the sport during the rise of mcgregor like and used to love conor mcgregor like i used to really love him um i i, I just i don't uh, he's he's hungry but he's hungry for attention now yeah that's it and I don't, and I just don't think that works at elite level the one thing he has going for him is michael chandler i believe he's 38 years old He's a guy that even though he says he feels great, it it doesn't matter. When you're 38, you're just you're you're not at an elite level anymore in that way. I mean, he can be fun, he can be entertaining. I just I just don't I don't know if a 38-year-old Michael Chandler really can win meaningful fights in the UFC um against top 10 type guys. That being said, I mean, people could say what they want. And like I said, uh, if you go back and rewatch the fight, like Connor was not doing bad in that fight that he broke his leg against Dustin Poirier. Um, arguably was winning the first round um, up until that point. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to see if Connor's sharp again, if he's, he's whatever. I don't think he can recapture another prime. I do think he could beat Michael Chandler. I don't know. I don't, I, I it wouldn't surprise me at all, but if they try and, but Connor versus Michael Chandler and and uh it turns out to be uh whatever and, and then they catapult Connor into the title fight with Islam or Dustin for a fourth time or up to Leon Edwards as rumor. He he gets smoked by all of them, I think. Yeah. I it's it's tough. I honestly Connor would be probably better off somehow losing to Chandler, deciding he still wants to fight, and then maybe doing the Nate Diaz trilogy doing a Tony Ferguson fight finally with both of them on losing streaks and some butter fights like that with people that are probably past their prime as well. Yeah, it's true. Why would he need to though? Cause he has all that money. It's, it's pretty hard dude to be a dog like yeah. those guys. I think, I think that was like Khabib too. Like it wasn't about money, but like at some point when you have enough money, it's just like, ah, what are we fighting for? Yeah. I'm good. Same with Canelo and Benavidez, you know, it's like Canelo's already had 65 something fights and he's probably, why do y'all want me to fight this young guy who's mauling people? Yeah. You what know, for? What, what do I need that? Because they want to see him get him? eaten. They yeah. want to see him get eaten. Maybe, you know, they want to see if Benavidez will eat him or not. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's just like, if you, you brought up basketball earlier, it's just like basketball, right? It's always like the passing of the guard, right? The Pistons were the top dog and then, you know, they, you know, they had to, or the, you know, Celtics and then 
the Pistons had to get through the Celtics and and whatever. And then the, the Bulls had to get through the bad boys Pistons and, and, you know, and you, you have to, they, there's always like this passing of the torch. The problem is in MMA and in fighting or boxing, the passing of the torch is usually a pretty violent, brutal one. Um, not just, uh, not just like getting swept in a seven game series or something like that. So maybe talk about, you said you had a big show kind of coming up. Let's talk about that. Uh, yeah, next weekend at the Maverick Center, next Friday night, uh, May 31st, um, we have two huge title fights as our co-main event and main event. Um, Jared Vandera, former UFC fighter, is our current um, pro heavyweight champ, and he um, he beat the an undefeated, a previously undefeated prospect here in Utah, Kent Mofaleo, for um, the heavyweight title uh, back in February, and he's now defending it against another Utah heavyweight Eric Iman in the co-main event. Um, Eric is 45, and it's kind of like his last fight, and he, you know, wants to try and bring the belt back to Utah. Um, it's kind of it's a pretty pretty fun storyline, and as one last uh, one last hurrah. But uh, you know, Jared's been pretty awesome to work with as he's trying to get back into the UFC. And then uh, we have a main event with two of the top bantamweights in the country. Uh, Mikey Sear from Warrior Camp um, is our current bantamweight champion. He, he's fighting Joel Haro from here in Utah. Um, five and one versus six and one bantamweight prospects. Winners probably get signed to Dana White Contender Series, if not straight to the UFC. Um, so there's a lot of big implications um, in that fight. Um, Mikey is a phenomenal grappler and, and submission artist, while Joel is a pretty electric striker, but pre pretty good all around. So um, Joel was the champion, um, had a bad night in the office and lost last year um, for the first time. Mikey um, beat the guy in January that beat Joel and Joel has gotten a win since then. And and so now they're, they're squaring off in our main event. So uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal night of fights with, uh, with 10 fights on the card. And where can people see if they're not in Utah? Yeah, so uh, our prelims, which is all of our amateur fights, are free on YouTube at Fierce Fighting Championship. So you can go uh, check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to it to see our prelims live for free. And then FierceFightingChampionship.com, we have a $30 pay-per-view for the for the main card. Um, five pro fights on it that are all, that are, you know, like, like I said, the, the, the co-main and main alone is worth the 30 bucks to, to check those out. But, uh, and then, um, all of our fights are on YouTube. So, um, after the fight fights happen. And, you know, normally when you have the, the big fight or where the big pro cards, is it normally that way? The pay-per-view? Yeah. Yeah. So we always just do our, our, our YouTube, our, our prelims are free on YouTube. And then our main card is a paper, a $30 pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, as we're kind of winding up this interview, I just wanted to, you know, I appreciate you taking the time again and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. If there, if there's a message you want to leave to people that are watching this or maybe something you wanted to touch on. Support local MMA, like support your local MMA show, buy tickets from them. Um, there is such a demand for, um, there's so, there's so much MMA out there. We're all competing for, um, you know, a fraction of it. But if you're, if you're in, if you're a fan of the UFC, you should go online and look up what shows are happening locally within driving distance of you. And every month or two, go to one of those shows and support them. Buy tickets from the local fighters. That's how they are making that you that's doing more to support local more to support MMA than anything else is, is supporting those local fighters that are chasing their dreams to get to the UFC. You, they, they're not going to get there if they can't like the business side of it. Again, it's what brought me to your page is that interview yeah. is somebody talking about the business side of it. There's so many people that don't understand how important it is to buy tickets from these fighters so that they can make a little bit more extra money on their commissions to help pay their coaches, pay their bills, do whatever, or, you know, hopefully only have to work part-time to pay the rest of their bills and not full-time on top of training so that they can get there. Um, and, you know, as a promoter, buying those tickets to supporting the shows so that we can keep doing it. I mean, if people knew how little money MMA shows actually made, I think they would be, they they'd go, what, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you spending this much time to make that little of money? And it's 
honestly, it's the love of the sport and the growth. Yeah. But if I don't like, you know, if we don't do it, like the pros don't have anywhere to fight here in Utah. You know, if the your local show doesn't do it, those those guys don't have a chance to to fight in front of their friends and family, which, you know, fighting on the road is really cool. But at the same time, like everybody wants to fight, be the hometown guy sometimes too, you know? So if I could encourage, if you are a fan of MMA or combat sports, boxing, I mean, I love the, some of the local boxing shows are really fun too, but support the amateur fighters, support the startup pro fighters, go to local shows, buy tickets, support the promotions so that they can continue to give a stage for those fighters to con continue to grow MMA and, you know, and funnel up to the UFC, you, you know, nobody, nobody's going to match the UFC. I hate to burst their bubble Bell Bellator PFL. Uh, anybody else that thinks that like, oh, I want to be the next UFC. No, like it's never going to happen. It's just like the NFL and everybody, every football league that tries to tries dies pretty quickly. But uh, the UFC is there to stay, but man, we could all become phenomenal funnels to the UFC. That's not, I kind of look at it. Like we're like the college funnels to the pro leagues, right? We we're in Utah. We, we, we want to be Oregon or USC in the West, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Zach, you know, it's a, it was a credible interview. I mean, I, it was a great interview and I'd love, love to have you back on or maybe on a anytime panel or on a panel, something like that. Sure. But, anytime. Uh, I and do. I, I want to have a conversation with that gentleman about I'll, that sometime. I'll tell you about him. So Miguel, uh, he was a matchmaker for a show called Hook and Shoot back in the 1990s. This sure. Je Jeff Osborne owned it. Uh -huh. um, he used to work for the UFC. He's kind of monotone voice guy way back in the 90s. I don't know how many shows he appeared on, but uh, he was the owner. And then Miguel got a job working for Bodog Fight, which was in Costa Rica. And this billionaire Calvin, yeah. Calvin Air owned Bodog Fight. So yeah. Miguel was the matchmaker for Bodog Fight, you know, and then Calvin Air got in trouble or whatever. So that, you know, that died. But, yeah. uh, and then he, he also worked the first seven out of Dobby's. So he's, he's got a background in a, you know, pretty extensive background. No, he knows. Yeah. I just, when, okay. So real quick, sorry to deviate. Yeah. Oh, my kids, my kids here, but um, sorry to deviate. But the, when people talk about, the, you know, fighter pay and things like this, one okay and this is the promoter side talking but i am a fighter yeah. too and i have friends and i want yeah. fighters to make more money and fighters leave a ton of money on the table and i would love i'll do a whole nother podcast on how fighters could make more money because as an amateur fighter i made thousands of dollars on ticket sales and sponsorship so like it's doable they just choose not to do it but when they talk about fighters don't make enough money after they do everything and it's not enough he brought up the point of fighting three times a year that's, that's eight. That's an eight week camp is the average. That's 24 weeks. That's less than half the year. What are they doing with their other six months? You know, well, the UFC yeah, only owes them it. three per contract. Sure. But, yeah. but, but they're making a choice to not be Kevin Holland and take fights all the time and always be ready. Right. Yeah. Cause like what we talked about earlier, some fighters, they fight and then they go, cool. I just made $15,000 on my show and win after everything. I got $15,000 in the bank. I'm just going to go chill for a month or two. Well, the problem with doing that is when you do that, you just, you, you just made a, you just, you just, how many opportunities did you miss in that, in that time to fight maybe good stylistical matchups that could have made you that you could have knocked somebody out and got a 50 K performance bonus or what you, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Kevin Holland doing it the way Kevin Holland's doing it. He's he, he was a fairly irrelevant guy and he made himself relevant by just fighting frequently and even taking matchups that were bad for him. And then he used those situations of being that guy to leverage it into contract negotiations makes, makes pretty decent money. Yeah. Fighting three times. He, year isn't enough, but you think they only get offered three times a year? No. If you're a pain in the butt to work with, then you only get offered three times a year. If you're a pain in the butt to work with, but if you're good work, good to work with and a good business partner and willing to have some give and take with it, the UFC works with you pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to bring you on to talk more about that because it's, it's an interesting subject. A lot of guys try to touch on it, but, uh, yeah. And everybody likes to crap on Dana White and the way he does things. 
And they're, I mean, fighter pay for sure. Would love to see the fighters get paid more for sure. But at the same time too, like he has like, he has over 700 fighters on the rock roster. We're not, we're not talking a few bucks. It's, you know, it, it's interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting dynamic for sure. But you know, I, I appreciate you taking time to do this. I know your kid just came back, but uh, you're good. Yeah. And uh, it's awesome interview. And uh, for everybody watching this, where can they find you at? Uh, Instagram Ridge seven, nine, but you know, most of my stuff's just on fierce fighting championship at fierce fighting championship or fierce fighting championship.com. Give us a follow, check us out, uh, subscribe to our YouTube, uh, a lot of good con content on there, fighter interviews, um, replays, highlights from our show. Um, yeah, we're going to have a great show next weekend. Uh, and even an incredible show three weeks after or two weeks after that. So, so we're staying busy. Yeah. Well, it's great talking to you, Zach, and look forward to talking to you again. And uh, you, everybody checked out the interview. Appreciate it. And uh, until next time, take care. Live to Fight is the type of company that Dana killed. It's a homegrown. It's a guy that just does good work and, you know, puts it out there. And if you can support him, you really should because – He's precisely a guy who can't, you know, his banners may not be able to hang on to UFC because he hasn't been able to pay them $100,000 to get his stuff out there. That's the corporate stuff that we're talking about now with the UFC that, you know, they've made everything at that level where it's all about money for them. And Live to Fight is a dude that does good work, makes you a great banner, and, you know, doesn't have a hundred thousand dollars to get on the UFC and stuff and deserve support. So anybody, any fighter out there, anybody out there, you know, owner of a gym or anything like that, that listens to us, God bless you. And thank you very much for your support. And, uh, you know, extend that to live to fight because he's one of us. Those guys are one of us.